spoke on the temptations of Jesus. And at the end of the service, I mentioned as I have been, if anybody has any questions or discussion or comments, feel free to talk to me because I like those questions and comments and those discussions. So I was asked the question, why did Jesus allow himself to be led by the devil? If you look at uh, the scriptures, it says Satan took Jesus to the mountaintop. Satan took Jesus to the high point of the temple. Satan took Jesus. Well, you would think Jesus being this all-powerful guy with God on his side could say, no, I'm not going with you. Have you ever had someone come to you and say, here, I want you to go with me, and you go, no. My grandkids do that once in a while. No. My kids used to do that once in a while. I'm bigger, I win. But anyhow, uh, Jesus was taken by Satan. So I did some studying on that question this week, and, and um, I'll probably end up having more discussions with it. But the thing I came up with is the fact that, that Jesus probably was not physically taken to those places. It was in his mind. Now, stop and think. Jesus hadn't had anything to eat for 40 days. He'd been out in the hot desert, probably freezing at night. And if, if you go, even if, if I miss a meal, Mar Marcy says that I eat to live. Some, no, what she say? I live to eat? Yeah, I live to eat. Uh, if I miss a meal, I can't think straight sometimes. In fact, right now, I'm getting hungry. I, I, I had breakfast. I, I, I've been sitting here snacking, but I'm hungry. I'm getting delirious. I may, may not be in my right mind. Uh, anyhow, the theory was is that Jesus was hungry, hot, exhausted, maybe a little bit dehydrated. And so he's in the desert. Now, the desert was a high place there. And from the desert, he could look around for miles and miles and miles. And so Satan came to him, and there probably was a stone there, and he probably looked at Jesus and said, you're hungry, turn that stone to bread. That was right there. But the mountain wasn't there. But it was in view off to the distance. And so Jesus was taken in his mind to the mountaintop. Jesus had probably been on the mountaintop already. He was familiar with the view from there. He was familiar that from there you could see miles and miles around. And so in his mind, Satan was able to tempt him. Also, Jesus is very familiar with the temple in the holy city, the high point of the temple. And in his mind, Satan took him there and suggested to him, you can jump from there and the angels will protect you. Um, I, I kind of like that explanation. It, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, in my own personal life, and in, in the lives of some of you, we've discussed different things. We've talked about the temptations. And you can be sitting there, and all of a sudden, a picture will come into your mind. That's a temptation. It's not that you're taken to that place physically, but that temptation is there. It can be real. It can be vivid. And Satan is very much in the middle of it. And we just need to remember that when we say, get thee behind me, Satan, get me out of there. I serve a higher power. Satan has to leave. No other way to put it. Satan has to leave. Well, I've already been a little bit delirious this morning. Jesse said something about the text message to come out about my message this week being, what keeps you awake at night? And I went, no, that was last week. Well, that is this week's. Now, I have a funny story to tell you. You know, I've been using my iPad up here for weeks because a lot lighter than my Bible and everything's in it. This week, I typed out my sermon notes. And when I went to save them to the format to put them in my iPad, I hit don't save. And so I have all these notes here this morning, but I have no idea what happened when they printed out because... And they're not even in concurrent pages. So, folks, I'm going to talk off the top of my head this morning. 
uh, which means we might be here twice as long. Or it means we might get out sooner. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about what keeps you awake at night. It's the same message that's there, just most of us up here. What keeps you awake at night? Um, I wake up every night about, well, now it's about two. It was about three. Well, sometimes it's whatever I drank before I went to bed that keeps me awake at night. You understand that. Um, sometimes it's things on my mind. Sometimes I lay there in bed wrestling over issues that have come up during the day. Sometimes I'll wake up about 4.30 in the morning with my heart pounding and, and wondering what's causing my heart to pound and race. Then I realize it's my blood sugar, blood sugar getting low and I need to get something in my stomach. Sometimes it's just all of a sudden you wake up just with all these thoughts going through your mind. What are you going to do about this thing and that thing? How to solve this problem? How to solve that problem? Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do about this thing in my life that you thought maybe you had solved and just all of a sudden it just comes and hits you upside the head again and you realize that you could be in trouble fast. I, I Thinking about that, and I'm thinking about Nicodemus, John chapter 3. There was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. What kept him awake at night? He knew about Jesus. He came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Rabbi, a teacher. He was familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. He was familiar with Jesus' teachings. He was familiar with what Jesus was doing. He said, no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus' comment after that kind of gets me a little bit. You have to understand that Nicodemus was part of the head of the religious leaders who told the Jews what they needed to do. Uh, Nicodemus probably couldn't come and talk to Jesus during the day for fear of criticism, for fear of siding with him. He needed to go at night when nobody would see him going. Also, it might be that uh, he tried to get to sleep and just couldn't because he had so many questions in his mind. And so he goes to Jesus, asks him that question. When I look at Jesus' reply, it's almost like Jesus is just talking about something else. Because he replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. You know, I wonder. I wonder if while they were sitting there talking, if a baby cried somewhere. Think about that. What triggered the comment that Jesus made? What was said maybe in between the lines here? Oh, a baby. Maybe a baby had just been born. Think about that. Anyhow, Jesus said, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. So Nicodemus says, how can someone be born when they're old? I think about this one. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a, yeah. And then Jesus comes up with this. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Water. What does water do? Cleanses, hydrates, refreshes. If it's hot water pounding on your back, it can take care of sore muscles. But it cleanses. Think of John the Baptist, people following his teachings. He baptized them, a symbol of being washed 
spiritually clean. But Jesus also added the spirit. Flesh gives birth to the flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. He's getting into some pretty deep thoughts here. Think Adam and Eve, the flesh, a horrible sin. And through them, we all have this carnal nature in us that causes us to go out and sin and do wrong things. The Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. If I have God's Spirit in me, then I start doing things His way. And that was the concept Jesus was trying to get to uh, Nicodemus. You should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. A new spirit given inside of us. A new thing, a, a new desires, a freshness. Our lives being transformed and turned around. And then this thought, Jesus says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. How many heard the wind Thursday night? <laughs> Boy, it just pounded our house. Now, Jesse was in Guatemala sweating to death. He, 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 he didn't hear the wind. It just roared and pounded. A week ago, last night, was another one of those windy nights. The wind just pounded. It pounded the front door out here and set the alarm off at 4.30 in the morning. Poor Mel ended up out here trying to figure out what was going on. The only thing they could figure out. The wind rattled the door. Well, this week on Thursday night when the wind came, Friday morning I get a phone call. Pastor, uh, did you know the light pole out here in the front yard blew over? No, I haven't been out to the church yet. I'm on my way. Had to be in the wind last night. Well, that wasn't so bad, but there was a 220-volt line sticking out of the ground that had to be capped off. I called the electrician. I didn't touch it. Um, so Jesus says, the wind blows. Well, as I watched the wind Thursday afternoon around our house and even early Friday morning, it just blew and blew and blew. Our lawn chairs in the backyard blew over. They're still that way. I haven't gone out and picked them up yet. They'll blow over again. Um, it, it just keeps going. Where does the wind start? Where does the wind end? We don't know. You could drive as far west as you want to go, and you'd probably still hit the wind and wonder, where's it coming from? You keep going east and east, you may eventually drive out of it, but not even realize you've driven out where the wind wasn't blowing. Now, last Saturday, we went down to Champaign, and that horrible wind even Saturday afternoon in the rain. As we're driving down to Champaign, I noticed I'm holding the steering wheel like this because the wind was blowing so hard from the southeast. And all of a sudden, I noticed that, that, that I'm angling this way because the wind had let up, but I had to turn the steering wheel back. Just all of a sudden, we drove out of the wind. It started again. But where does the wind start? And where does it end? And as Jesus talks about this, he says you, don't, you can't tell where it's coming from, but that's the way it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now I've been thinking about the Holy Spirit. Think about in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God was above the waters. Where did it come from? No one knows. It was just there. I, I look in Acts chapter 2. They heard the power of the Holy Spirit like a wind rushing down from the heavens. And it went through the whole place that they were in. They knew something had happened. But where did it come from? Where did it come from? I'm thinking of the great revival of, what, 1970 or 71 that started in Asbury College in Kentucky and literally swept the nation. 
university after university, the power of the Holy Spirit was there. Just all of a sudden, there it was. I remember holding a weekend revival that uh, weekend, and, and we were in a little town up in mid-Michigan. I know, you just love it when I say Michigan. Uh, we were up there, and, and we were supposed to come back on Sunday afternoon. And things were going so well, the pastor said, is there any chance you guys can stay for the evening service? So we called back to campus and got permission to stay. Um, and they based it on the fact that there were no bad weather reports. The wind wasn't blowing. We stayed and had a fantastic Sunday night service in that church, not knowing what had happened at Asbury. We drove back and got back here at 3 o'clock in the morning because guess what? Bad snowstorm. We were driving down Interstate 57 following a semi hoping we'd get back to campus on time, literally. As we pulled into campus, we just kind of noticed. I remember one of my friends in the car saying, just seems so quiet and peaceful here. Well, that's because at 3 o'clock in the morning, we usually locked away in our dorms. What we didn't know, fall or winter revival had just ended on campus with a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which the next morning in chapel took over, and chapel lasted all day. Where does the Spirit come from? Where does it go? Where does it begin? Where does it end? We have times in our services where people are just up testifying because the Holy Spirit has come upon us and, and changed our lives dramatically. And there's other times where it just comes quietly with peace and a calm assurance. And there's other times where we almost beg for the Spirit to come because we just feel that we need that refreshing. Nicodemus looked back at Jesus and said, you're Israel's teacher. You don't understand these things. I tell you that we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still, you people, the Jews, do not accept what we're talking about. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, talking about himself. And then Jesus talks about Moses lifting up the snake in the wilderness. That's a whole other uh, can of worms, a uh, can of snakes to talk about, but not today. Then he said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus Christ must be glorified. He must be praised so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. That's the end of what Jesus is saying. Then these words are in black. Jesus didn't say them. This is John writing. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him, whosoever accepts the Spirit of God, will not die and go to the fires of hell, but will have eternal spiritual life. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Condemnation. What keeps you awake at night? Guilt? I know about that. It doesn't have to. The questions of life don't have to. Because when we begin to trust and believe in Jesus, the light that came into the world is also the light that comes into our life. I want you to think about something about Nicodemus. As they were sitting there talking, I wonder if it was a hot, sultry, still night in Galilee. I wonder as if they were talking if all of a sudden a cool, refreshing breeze blew across from the sea and into the house where they were sitting. And I wonder if that's what triggered the discussion about the wind. And as they talked, Nicodemus began to understand 
the wind. You see, Nicodemus was there at the cross. Nicodemus was the one who refused to condemn Jesus and put him to death. Somewhere in there, Nicodemus believed in Jesus Christ. Somewhere in there, he allowed his life to be transformed. And somewhere in there, he was at the cross. Not ashamed to stand up where he believed in anymore. Not hiding at night, but buying the embalming supplies, 70 pounds worth, and having his servant help carry them to the cross, where after Jesus' limp body was, they took it down from the cross, him and Joseph Arimathea, and they embalmed it, and they wrapped it in linens, and they put him in the tomb. Somewhere in there, Nicodemus believed. Somewhere in there, the Spirit got a hold of him. Somewhere in there, he was transformed. Somewhere in there, he began to believe. I'm very aware of the fact this morning that most people here believe. Most people have been transformed in their lives. But I'm also aware of the fact that through God's love, we just need to remember over and over again of the price that Jesus paid for us because God loved us so much. And we need to allow a new refreshing of the Spirit to flood over us. Would you join me in that thought this morning?